The ABC of the Universe. Today's talk in this BBC series is given by Dr John Baldwin, a radio astronomer working at Cambridge. He calls his talk The Expanding Universe. Suppose that we explore outwards from the Earth, through the solar system and on out between the nearby stars and through the spiral arms. If we go far enough, we reach what may be called the edge of the Milky Way. It isn't, of course, a sharp edge, with all the stars of the Milky Way inside it and none outside. But we do reach a point where the stars begin to thin out and almost empty space lies before us. What, if anything, is there to be seen beyond the edge? This is what I want to talk about today. On photographs of the sky taken with large telescopes, we find, in addition to the stars, a lot of fuzzy, faintly luminous objects called nebulae. There seem to be two distinct kinds. Nebulae of the first kind are usually irregular in shape and lie on or near the Milky Way. These are just clouds of gas, heated by the presence of nearby stars, so that they glow and we can see them. They belong to our Milky Way, and so we are not concerned with them today. Nebulae of the second kind are quite different. They are often regular in shape, perhaps oval or circular, and they lie in regions of sky away from the band of the Milky Way. The brightest of them in the northern hemisphere is the nebula in Andromeda, which is visible to the naked eye as a hazy patch. We now know that objects of this kind are galaxies, similar to the Milky Way, our own galaxy, in many respects, but lying far beyond its edges. On a photograph, we don't, of course, get any idea of the relative distances of these galaxies as compared to the stars of the Milky Way, since they all appear projected on the background of the sky. But with the largest telescopes, it is possible to photograph a few of the brightest individual stars in the nearby galaxies. Some of these stars are of recognisable types, corresponding to the same sorts found in our own galaxy. From their apparent brightness, we can calculate the distance out to the galaxy in which they lie. So we are now quite certain that the brightest of the nebulae are galaxies similar to and outside the Milky Way. The nearest of them, the clouds of Magellan, visible to the naked eye in the southern hemisphere, are only about 200,000 light years away. The nebula in Andromeda is about 2 million light years away, and it's the most distant object we can see with the naked eye. It isn't perhaps so surprising that it is possible to see so far if we think that the light of the little fuzzy patch we are looking at is that of a hundred thousand million stars like the Sun. Now I mentioned that we can only photograph the very brightest stars in the nearby galaxies. All the fainter stars are too weak to be picked out as individuals. It's interesting to compare our knowledge of our own galaxy with that which we have of our near neighbours. In our galaxy, we know a great deal about the stars close to the Sun, and we also have a fair idea of the spiral structure of the galaxy from the measurements of the radio emission from the cold hydrogen gas. But the general picture is still not good enough, because we can't get outside the Milky Way and look. On the other hand, in the external galaxies, although we know almost nothing about the stars themselves, we see the general structure very well. For example, the beautiful spiral patterns show in all their intricate detail, especially in those galaxies in which we see the flat disk of stars face on. Beyond the nearby galaxies, there are a great many others. The number within range of the largest telescopes is perhaps 10,000 million. As with stars, Nature has provided a huge number of examples for the astronomer to study and classify. This doesn't just mean more work for astronomers. It is in fact a great help to have so many to look at. Each individual galaxy is seen from one particular angle, and examples seen at all different angles must be used to build up three-dimensional models of the different types. Broadly speaking, there seem to be two main sorts. First, the elliptical or oval galaxies, which, as their name implies, look elliptical when seen in the sky. They are relatively smooth and featureless in appearance, bright in the centre, fading away imperceptibly at the edges 
into the general background light of the sky. Second, the spiral galaxies, which usually have the form of a thin flat disk. The light from the main mass of stars, which makes up the disk, has, superimposed on it, two bright arms, which reach out from the centre of the galaxy in two interlocking spirals. Our own galaxy and that in Andromeda are both examples of the spiral kind. Measurements made on these spiral galaxies show that they are rotating like wheels, except that the inner parts of the wheel rotate faster than the outer parts. Now this is just what has been found in our own galaxy. From their rotations, we can work out the masses of the galaxies. Measured in tons, these masses don't mean very much, but they come out at about 100,000 billion suns for the larger ones, very similar to the Milky Way. About the origin of the galaxies and the factors which determine their size, their shape and structure, we know almost nothing at all. For the bright galaxies, all we have is pictures of them in their present state, or rather as they were a few million years ago when the light set out towards us. But we don't expect there to have been many changes in times as short as a few million years. Our present picture is therefore roughly like this. In the arms of the spiral galaxies, there are large amounts of glowing gas and a lot of hot young stars. The process of star formation from cold hydrogen gas is still clearly going on, although most of the hydrogen has by now been converted into stars. Why there should be arms having a spiral pattern is still a mystery. In the elliptical galaxies, on the other hand, there are no hot young stars. The process of star formation seems to have ceased a long time ago, and there is now a population consisting entirely of old stars. Whether this difference between spirals and ellipticals reflects a different time of origin or method of formation is still a matter for speculation. So far, this has been a very brief summary of what we know about individual galaxies. Now let's consider them collectively, their distribution in space and the action they have on one another. To do this, we need to know how far away from us they are. Beyond the nearest galaxies, where it is still possible to distinguish the brightest stars, a new method for measuring their distances must be used. It really depends on the following argument. If we look at just one apparently faint galaxy, then it may be a giant galaxy at a great distance, or it may be a dwarf one close at hand. We can say very little about it. But a group of galaxies at a great distance probably has the same proportion of giants and dwarfs in it as a group nearby. The apparent brightness to us of the near group and the distant group can then be used to get their relative distances. Using this method, we get a reasonable idea of the distribution of galaxies in space. On the average, they are about three million light years apart. Think of this in terms of a model instead of the cold numbers. Represent a spiral galaxy by, say, the leaf of a tree, about two inches or five centimetres across. Then the extent of the visible universe, that is, what we can photograph in optical telescopes, would be a region about eight miles or twelve kilometres across, filled with leaves each about three metres or ten feet from its nearest neighbour. Looked at in this way, space doesn't seem quite so empty. That is the overall distribution of galaxies. But if we look at photographs, it is very obvious that the galaxies are not distributed over the sky purely at random. They show a strong tendency to cluster together. Our own galaxy, the nebula in Andromeda, the Magellanic Clouds, and a few others form one small cluster. Some clusters, on the other hand, contain several hundred galaxies and are very densely packed. Again we reach an unsolved puzzle. The fact that clustering occurs is well known. It probably is the result of the process of formation of the galaxies from the original gas. But its significance still needs to be adequately explained. But the most remarkable and unexpected fact about the galaxies are their movements relative to us. We have been able to measure these movements 
by using the so-called Doppler effect, something which is most familiar to us when we listen to train whistles. When a train is approaching, the pitch of its whistle is higher than normal, and when the train has passed, the pitch is lower. The same effect occurs with light as with sound, but we are not familiar with it on the Earth, since the source of light must move with very great speed before the effect is noticeable. When a source of light approaches us, the pitch is raised and the light is bluer than normal. When the source moves away from us, the pitch is lowered and the lighter is redder than normal. The effect can be detected in the light given out by the external galaxies. The nearby galaxies move relatively slowly with respect to us, but when we go further to fainter and more distant galaxies, all of them show a shift of their light towards the red end of the spectrum, showing that they are moving away from us and at enormous speeds. This is the well-known redshift effect. As we go to more and more distant galaxies, the redshift and hence the velocity of recession increases. It's a good approximation to say that the speed of recession increases proportionally to the distance, so that the most distant objects we can measure are moving away from us at about 150,000 kilometers a second, or half the speed of light. What is at first sight most surprising is that all the galaxies appear to be moving away from us. It is really very hard to believe now that we are in a special position in the universe. We know the Earth is just one of several planets moving round a very average star situated about halfway out to the edge from the centre of the galaxy. Our galaxy is a large one, but there are many millions similar to it. On these grounds, it seems very unlikely that we are in any privileged position in the universe. It must therefore be true that any observer on any other galaxy would see the same apparent recession of all the galaxies from him. This is just what happens in an explosion. All the bits of material thrown out after the bang move away from the centre, but they also get further apart from one another. It may then be that the outward motion of the galaxies, which we see, the so-called expanding universe, is the result of some initial explosion in which all the matter of the universe was involved. The expansion of the universe is explained in different cosmological theories in different ways, some of which involve an initial explosion and some do not. At present, both optical and radio astronomers are much concerned in making observations which will test the different theories of the origin of the universe. But you'll be hearing more about that later in this series. The Expanding Universe, the fifth talk in the BBC series The ABC of the Universe, was given by Dr John Baldwin of Cambridge.